Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, guilty or not guilty, New Jersey senior senators still waiting. Day three came and went, still no verdict in the corruption trial of Senator Bob Menendez. What happens to teens when they age out of the foster care system? That was a question one organization called Roots and Wings didn't want left unanswered. New Jersey election results, gains for Democrats make a Trenton trifecta. Plus, the big winner makes one last campaign stop, Governor-elect Murphy thanking commuters before taking on the toughest job in Jersey and thanking those who've died defending our freedoms. For Veterans Day, students plant a whole field of flags. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Phil Murphy's got the governor's job. Now comes the hard part, appointing a transition team, filling key positions, laying out policies, and getting lawmakers on board. But not before pausing to thank some commuters who might have given him their trust. Senior correspondent David Cruz was along for the handshaking in Hoboken. Phil Murphy bounded onto the stage in Asbury Park with insouciant glee, unlike a man weighed down by the enormity of the task ahead. After more than two years of running, the governor-elect could be forgiven his moment of levitation. Tonight, we declare the days of division are over. We will move forward together. This is exactly who we are, New Jersey. We have each other's backs. To believe in each of us is to believe in all of us. This morning, the governor-elect was greeting commuters in Hoboken, and for a minute there, their gotta-go-to-work indifference bordered on awkward. Everybody, Phil Murphy, how are you, folks? Addressing an early morning gaggle of reporters, Murphy talked about his phone call with Governor Chris Christie. He and I spoke last evening. It was a very gracious, very good conversation, focused literally 100% on transition. He and I will meet uh, live in the next couple of days. I don't think we have it scheduled yet, but he and I are trying to find some time to sit. Um, and it was a really good conversation, as was my conversation with the lieutenant governor. Murphy appeared with Hoboken mayor-elect Ravi Bala, a Sikh whose victory came in the face of a late-in-the-campaign anonymous racist flyer. Bala said the win was a victory for the city's better angels. I hope so. Uh, you know, that's not what Hoboken's about. We're a very diverse and welcoming city, and uh, I think um, hopefully my election shows that. Murphy said he wants to be the governor for all 9 million residents of New Jersey and pointed to Bala's victory as a sign that unity could be the residue of all this contentious campaigning. But Rutgers political science professor Mary Seegers says Murphy's path is fraught with political potholes. He's going to have uh, some things that he has to discover, which is, first of all, how difficult it is to work with the legislature, <laughs> which has its own priorities and yeah. commitments. And uh, I mean, we know from Washington that uh, if you have the same party in both the White House and Congress, they don't always work. And he's going to have that here. The campaign confirmed today that Hackensack Meridian Health Chief of Staff Jose Lozano will lead the Murphy transition, and sources say that Pete Camerano, the former chief to Senator Dick Cody, will be Murphy's chief of staff, something the governor-elect was not confirming today. We're going to kick it off today. We're going to kick it off today, so stay tuned. Murphy spent $16 million of his own cash to get the nomination and another $8 million in public funds for the general election, for which he wins the honor of trying to steer the ship of state from starboard to port. In Hoboken, I'm David Cruz, NJTV News. In a state that suffered 11 credit downgrades, credit agencies were watching this election with interest. Standing by at the Strategic Development Group studio at the NJCU School of Business is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, it is a bit of a post-election buzzkill from one ratings agency. Standard & Poor's has delivered its financial assessment of New Jersey for Governor-elect Murphy and the newly elected legislature. S&P saying the state's long-term credit conditions will remain challenging 
for the foreseeable future, no matter what policy direction they choose. S&P also says to tackle pension funding and school aid funding, the state will likely have to raise revenue or cut expenses. And in terms of the state's pension shortfall, S&P says getting New Jersey out of that situation could take years and multiple gubernatorial administrations. Several business groups around the state weighing in after the election, offering congratulations to the governor-elect and asking him to include their input in any policies that would impact business in the state. The NJBIA says it's committed to working with Governor-elect Murphy on issues and policies most impacting New Jersey businesses and residents, including affordability, economic development and taxation, and regional competitiveness. The State Chamber of Commerce says, we look forward to working with the new governor and his team and members of the legislature as we promote a strategic plan for a more affordable New Jersey. And the National Federation of Independent Businesses says the small business community wants nothing more than to see the state of New Jersey prosper under the next administration. And in order for our economy and our small business sector to thrive, we firmly believe that the small business community must have a seat at the policy table. New Jersey's job growth bounced back in October. According to Roseland-based ADP's Regional Employment Report, the state added 6,500 private sector jobs last month. The service sector saw the biggest jump with 4,800 new jobs. Remember, for the month of September, ADP had reported New Jersey lost 600 jobs. One of the state's biggest insurance companies is playing ball with the Trenton Thunder. NJM Insurance Company says starting next year, it will become the presenting partner of the ball team, which is a first for the Thunder. According to NJM, the presenting partnership agreement reaffirms the commitment of both organizations to the revitalization of Trenton. NJM and the Thunder have been collaborating together for years, and NJM has donated tens of thousands of dollars to nonprofits in the city. On Wall Street, stocks ended slightly higher. And those are our top business stories. Abysmal. That's how voter turnout in yesterday's election was characterized by a Monmouth pollster. Tallies in 99% of precincts shows just 36% of registered voters went to the polls. That is an all-time low. A 2007 study concluded lousy weather decreased voter turnout and benefited Republicans. Well, not this time. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Republican Kim Guadano's tumultuous campaign ended in a crushing loss. Outspent three to one and trailing throughout by double digits in the polls, the lieutenant governor could not evade her eight-year connection to catastrophically unpopular Governor Christie. Even a last-minute hard right turn to Trump-style topics and tactics failed. We left no stone unturned and we would not have done anything differently. Guadana lost by 13 points, but a bit stubbornly refused to blame her boss. People are talking about the Christie effect? None. I, you know what? I ran my own campaign. Her running mate spoke more freely about the political reverberations rocking New Jersey's Republican Party and resonating all the way down the ballot. This is being called a backlash against Chris Christie and Donald Trump. Well, you know, we knew that we were up against all odds. We were outnumbered in registrations. We're, uh, we were up against the Christie effect. We knew that from the get-go. I think right now it is, it is a rejection of the, of the president and the politics there. I mean, it, you know, certainly there are other factors that go into play with any race. If you look at lieutenant governor, I thought she ran a strong race, was underfunded in what's traditionally a very blue state anyway. This is part of a national mood here in New Jersey. So even while we had a record low turnout for the governor's race. In competitive races, there was a significant enthusiasm gap that benefited Democrats. New Jersey will now be one of eight so-called trifecta states, where Democrats control both houses of the legislature and the governor's office. Republicans have 26. But Jersey Democrats also boosted their legislative margins, winning two seats formerly held by Republicans Jack Cittarelli and Chris Brown. That'll give them a 28-seat majority in the Assembly. Democrats also gained a Senate seat, raising that majority to 10 after Democrat 
Vin Gopal beat longtime Republican Jennifer Beck in the 11th district. When you have an avalanche of money, uh, it's almost, look, when, when you know it's been someone five, seven to one, it's almost brainwash money. If you had an even, even playing field here, Jen Beck would still be a senator. A Republicans may control the legislature if you had an even playing field of money. The legislature's most expensive race, costing a combined $20 million, pitted incumbent Democratic Senate President Steve Sweeney against an NJEA funded Republican opponent. Sweeney won by 18 points and remains angry at the teachers union officials. This was personal, it was a vendetta, and they wanted to teach a lesson. They wanted to be able to show the entire state of New Jersey that they control New Jersey. And if you cross them, this is where you're going to get. Well, I can tell you right now, I will stand for the taxpayers of this state every single day against million dollar lobbyists. In major mayoral races, Steve Fulop won a second term in Jersey City and in Atlantic City, Council President Frank Gilliam beat incumbent Don Guardian. But again, this election defied the norm that all politics is local. This is about national issues. And if this mo mood prevails uh, going into the 2018 midterms, uh, there are a number of Republican congressmen here in New Jersey who should be extremely nervous. New Jersey voters also approved two ballot questions. One okays borrowing $125 million to improve libraries. The other says any money the state wins in environmental lawsuits must be spent to restore the environment. In Newark, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Sold, maybe, that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Atlantic City, where the shuttered Revel Casino may have a new buyer. The $2.4 billion white elephant developer Glenn Straub bought out of bankruptcy for $82 million, never did reopen. For two years, it's 13 restaurants, more than an acre of retail space, and lavish spa have been vacant. Straub has set several deadlines for reopening the property and repeatedly blamed state and local officials for holding things up. Well, now Straub's company and a Colorado-based group have filed a notice of settlement for the sale of the Revel Casino Hotel. No sales price was listed. Next to Newark, where Apostle House was open and offering a Thanksgiving feast served up by celebrity chefs, New York Jets safety Terrence Brooks teamed up with three-time bodybuilding champ Carlo Filippone to hand out meals to more than 50 homeless men and women served by the Apostle House shelter. The 2017 annual NJ Counts found 8,532 homeless men, women, and children across the state of New Jersey. That's fewer than the year before, but more among them are chronically homeless. Finally, Wayne preparing a field of flags for Veterans Day. William Patterson University's Office of Veteran and Military Affairs organized the Veterans Day observance in Zanfino Plaza, enlisting the help of sororities, fraternities, and the Student Veterans Organization to help plant 5,000 flags in memory of soldiers who lost their lives in operations Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom. Former Marine and Eastside High School history teacher Augustin Castillo brought 50 of his students to join the William Patterson faculty, staff, and students in honoring America's fallen. And that's a Garden State Express for Wednesday, November 8th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. There are few things political operatives and reporters like more than Wednesday morning quarterbacking the Tuesday election. The vice chair of the state Democratic Party, Lizette Delgado Polanco, and Republican strategist Chris Russell joined chief political correspondent Michael Aaron. Lizette, let me start with you. What's your takeaway from yesterday's election? Well, as a Democrat, as you may imagine, we're very happy. Um, we had an incredible uh, turnout, incredible victory. Big margins that we did not expect, especially with the late rain, which kind of delayed everything. We were a little concerned. Um, we knew that some of the victories, and we were praying that would be double-digit victories, but we, when we saw that rain in the afternoon, we were concerned about um, turnout. But it turned out to be an incredible night for us. Um, 
especially in southern Jersey, I mean, Steve Sweeney winning by 20 points is an amazing um, victory and a resounding victory. And I, of course, I have to toot the House of Labor for that victory, because we all came in together to help him. And in Vin Gopal, the biggest surprise of the night, which his uh, victory over Jen Beck was a shocker for everyone. Chris, your takeaway of from this election. Well, listen, disappointed, of course. Um, it was a tough night for Republicans. Some bright spots, Chris Brown down in South Jersey in Atlantic County was a, a big, bright star, and I think uh, only shine brighter in the, in the years to come. Uh, but, but a tough night. Listen, uh, we faced a difficult national environment, a governor with uh, historically low approval ratings. People wanted to change New Jersey. Uh, they got it at the top. Democrats are now going to be in charge of uh, all of Trenton. No impediment, I think, in some ways, that could be a benefit to, to Republicans, as there's no, no blaming anymore from the Democrats in terms of where the state is and its finances and, and how things go forward. And if, you know, Phil Murphy governs like he campaigned as uh, someone to the far left, I think that's going to be a benefit to help the Republican Party rebuild and remessage here. Where was the surprise last night? Uh, Morris County almost went Democratic in the assembly races. Don Guardian, Atlantic City, uh, appears to have lost his election. What else was a surprise to either of you? Well, I, I think some of the, you know, there's some, some county difficulties. Burlington County lost two freeholders narrowly, but, but lost them. I mean, it's a difficult county, more than 30,000 Democrats than Republicans, but thought we could hold on there. Uh, Somerset County lost a county clerk. Um, and, and, you know, no pickups really outside of Chris Brown anywhere on the legislative side. So disappointing just in that um, I think we thought we could hold our own. I don't think anyone was thinking about big pickups last night, but, but hope to hold our own and, and fell back a few steps. But again, you know, the uh, epitaphs are written in politics far too soon a lot of times. We'll be back. Democrats picked up one Senate seat, two assembly, two assembly seats. seats. Did anything surprise you? Well, night? actually, we put it, uh, we really worked on this campaign, like really to bring it back to the people and make it a grassroots effort on, all around. So, but we were surprised with Fryman. We knew that we mounted. Fryman, that's District 16, that's District 16. in Somerset yes, County, in Somerset Hunter County. and Middlesex, and, and we, Princeton. We were concerned. We were really concerned about because it is a very. That's where you picked up district. an assembly seat. We picked up an assembly seat with, and Andrew Zwicker is going back to the assembly, which is amazing in 16. And also, you know, in Legislative District 2, with having the victory of Chris Brown as the Senate, the two Democrats winning the seats. You picked up an assembly we picked seat up an there. assembly seat there. Yes, absolutely. Turnout was only 36 percent. Uh, it's been lower every year since 1993. It goes down and down and down. <clears throat> in Virginia, where there was a governor's race, they had the highest turnout in 20 years, at 47 percent. Why was turnout so low in New Jersey? Listen, I think one of the reasons is our legislative map is completely unbalanced, and it doesn't have any com there's the, the, the so few competitive elections on the legislative side in our state. There's no reason for people to come out in some of these districts, either Democratic or Republican. So I think one thing that Republicans, I, I know we need to get a better map in the state, one, to compete more on the legislative side. But there side. was a governor's race. Wouldn't they come out to vote for their next governor? I, apparently not, Michael. And I think that's because it turned into an election of partisans, and there's more Democratic partisans than Republican. I well, think what you would see, though, helpful to the state, not just politically to Republicans, but helpful to the state, are more competitive legislative map where you can have uh, elections that people are going to be interested in following. They're not interested in a lot of these elections. Well, I, I disagree, because I think that there was a lot more uh, excitement just having gone through so many election cycles in the state. I know that the turnout was low. Um, we did have, like I said before, I think the turnout would have been higher had the weather been... It was pretty brutal towards the end. Um, so that last push, I think, if you look at the numbers, might have been uh, 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 a factor. But I think Phil Murphy really did excite after seven and a half, almost eight years of Christie and Godano. And I think that, you know, he really did excite the New Jersey Democrats. We're running out of time, but what's Phil Murphy's biggest challenge in 20 seconds? I think Phil Murphy's biggest challenge is walking into, it's not a pretty picture, walking into uh, the state. And it's going to be a big challenge. But I think we can all come together and figure it out collectively without, you know, leaving behind the disadvantaged and taking care of all families in New Jersey. Chris, Murphy's biggest challenge? 
Well, I think Murphy's biggest challenge will find out how he works with the Democratic legislature. He's going to be asked to do everything that he promised to do, and I don't think he can do it all. There's not enough money. It doesn't grow on trees. So I think his biggest challenge will be to keep all these people together. And does he come out as a centrist? Does he try to do things that reach out to Republicans? Or does he just run a, a, a hard left government like he ran a hard left campaign? If he does that, I think he alienates people. And two years from now, I think we could see a resurgence for Republicans. Chris Russell, Lizette Delgado Polanco, thank you both very much. Thank Thanks you for much. having us. Day three of jury deliberations is still no verdict in the federal corruption trial of Senator Bob Menendez. The jury asked Judge William Walls for a 3.30 dismissal this afternoon to avoid Newark's rush hour traffic and didn't emerge once from the jury room. Outside the courthouse, Menendez was asked about the stress of waiting for a decision. After two and a half years of living through this odyssey, uh, waiting for the jury to do what they think is uh, right, is not something I worry about, and I have every expectation that, based upon all of the facts that have been presented at this trial, if they listen to the law and the facts, I'm convinced we will be exonerated, and that's worth waiting for. Thank you. Young adults aging out of foster care often have neither places to stay nor life skills to become self-sufficient. Leah Mishkin reports on an organization that gives them both roots and wings. My mom passed away when I was eight, so my brother and I, we've been in um, foster homes since then. There was a lot of um, physical, mental, and psychological abuse. I had to become a woman before I could ever finish being a child. Her mom was her best friend. Her foster family felt like strangers. That was the way it was for Tanisha Warmack until her foster care experience ended at 21. I guess the one thing that kind of, you know, helped me persevere was uh, writing and music. It was her caseworker who helped her find the place where we're sitting. The organization is called Roots and Wings. Roots and Wings serves aged out foster youth in the state of New Jersey. So it's kids who are 18 to 24, who were never permanently adopted. According to the New Jersey Child Placement Advisory Council, over 300 youth aged out of the foster care system in 2016. But Roots and Wings says that number almost certainly understates the problem because former foster youth who return home or get adopted before they're 18 may still find themselves in need of help once they become adults. Most of the kids don't have their high school diploma. Um, so they come to us homeless oftentimes, sleeping on park benches or couch surfing with friends. They've experienced a great deal of trauma, um, either through the foster care system experience or through their biological families, um, but they're very resilient. Where were you in your life when you found this organization? I wasn't doing so well, actually. I was on my way to homelessness because my father, he wasn't doing so well, and I couldn't really go to him. My mother moved to Texas. So it was kind of like I was alone. 22-year-old Robert Brown says now he's in school and his dreams of becoming a lawyer are getting closer. For the first time, he feels hopeful. Usually we're, we're at points in our life where, oh, this is going to stop. It's over. I don't know what I'm going to do after that. You know what you're going to do after here. You know where you're going, and that is the brilliant. They the don't, brilliance let, they don't of, let go until yes. they know. Okay, You're set, set up yes, with his job, with his schooling, yes. with his apartment. Car even, they help you with almost any aspect that you can think of. That's something he says he is not used to feeling. After our interview, Brown sat down with his case manager. But what caught our attention even more was when he left to go to school, she went downstairs with him to make sure he got into his car all right. Later, Rebecca. It was the same attention to detail in the office. When Emily was showing Tanisha the food pantry, Tanisha said she loved hot chocolate. Emily then asked what kind. No sugar added, milk chocolate or with marshmallow or just marshmallows. It's that attention to detail that makes Tanisha Warmack feel like she is home. I honestly never thought that I would be happy, but They've made all of that possible for me. In Denville, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. And now some noteworthy facts from tonight's program that help you know Jersey. New Jersey is now one of eight so-called trifecta states where Democrats control both houses of the legislature and the governor's office. 
Standard & Poor's says New Jersey's fiscal situation will be a challenge for Governor-elect Phil Murphy. Murphy's picked Hackensack Meridian Health Chief of Staff Jose Lozano to lead the gubernatorial transition team. And Hoboken voters have made Ravi Bala New Jersey's first Sikh mayor. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, deliberations resume in Senator Bob Menendez's corruption trial. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJN Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Hi, I'm Ralph LaRosa. Oh, and Elmo's Elmo. And we're here to remind you how important it is for your family to have an emergency kit. That's right, just in case. I'm thinking about what to put in my family's emergency kit. Want to help me think? Okay. An emergency kit should have a flashlight and extra batteries. Oh, flashlight? Oh, batteries? And lots of water and canned food. Oh, okay. Water? Oh, canned food? Wow, Elmo, you really are a good thinker. Thank you, Mr. Ralph. <laughs> Download Sesame Street's free Let's Get Ready app at your favorite app store today. In every county across the state. I do like that Horizon is a Jersey company. It's almost like a sports team for us. It's like ours. In sickness and in health. You never think it's going to happen to you, especially being so young. Horizon has been there for me through everything I've been through. With experience and stability, we're behind you. You know, we're hardworking people in New Jersey. Horizon gets us.